Uh, actually, I'm terrified because I'm not a physician, so <laughs> I, I, I have a PhD in genetics and I'm a genetic counselor, so I, did, I do some clinical work and I did, but I'm not a physician, so, and I know there are much more uh, experts in the room on EDS than I am, but uh, I'll give you my experience with it. I'll be doing this with uh, the participation of Sarah Jill Rush, who's a 19-year-old um, uh, who has uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and lives in Vancouver, and she's a fine art photographer. And I'll be showing you some photography she um, um, put online for, uh, did and put online for uh, International Rare Disease Day in February. So why am I uh, talking, uh, giving an overview of a 100-year-old disease is because um, I am a genetic counselor, but now I'm director of the Quebec Coalition of Orphan Diseases, a nonprofit organization. We have a service which is an information portal people uh, on rare diseases. People can call up for information or support on any rare disease. The disease for which people call up, call us or write to us the most is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. We have at least two, three people a week who call us. And typically, it's a, a woman uh, between 30 and 50 years old, I'd say, who self-diagnoses through the internet and had uh, many surgeries, uh, mo some of them had many surgeries, have been to physiotherapy, have problems with chronic pain, uh, and um, uh, so that's the, uh, and many of them actually also have lots of psychosocial and economic issues. They, um, many can't work anymore, but they can't get disability status either because they don't have a diagnosis or it's not, uh, t it's not believed that they are um, invalid. Or they have problems with the work um, health and safety board or their insurance, etc. Then there are the others who have a diagnosis of EDS and call us up because they have management and treatment problems. They're not properly uh, managed. The disease is not properly managed. So obviously, uh, that really is the average age of people who call us, but these women uh, obviously have not been diagnosed, but, um, even if they had signs and symptoms of disease when they were children. So this situation obviously is not unique to Quebec, and the ILC Foundation knows about that for the rest of Canada and even from Quebec, but, uh, and also in other countries in the world. And Aurora, which is um, an umbrella organization in Europe for rare diseases, which uh, has a membership of some 300, 400 rare disease patient organizations, made a survey, uh, did a survey from 2003 to 2008 questionnaires on different rare diseases, and one of the diseases was uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. They got questionnaires from 414 families from five countries, and the, the results for diagnosis was that 50% were diagnosed at uh, 29 years, 25% were prior to 13 years of age, and 25% had been diagnosed after 41 years of age. Uh, the number of consultations until diagnosis was more than five physicians in 60% of the cases, more than 20 physicians in 20% of the cases, misdiagnosis in six, 56%, and psychiatric uh, diagnosis in 20%, and inappropriate treatment in 70% of the people who responded. So, and those are, we have, um, we did a rare disease survey on, but on, all rare diseases, and when we took the small sample we had at the time for EDS, it's very similar to this. So this is uh, uh, this is how uh, Sarah Jill depicts this uh, this diagnostic odyssey, falling through the cracks or having uh, difficulty getting proper treatment. And I heard that in your video <laughs> several times. Uh, it's all in your head. So she depicts it like this. This is her actual, her actual scan. And uh, so she says it's normal, so it's not in her head, the EDS. So why, why is, are we in a situation where we have a 100-year-old disease, but we're still in this situation in 2013? 
It's a rare disease, but it's not the rarest of disease, and now we even think that it's probably much more frequent than we uh, estimated. There were meetings, as you can see, that uh, for consensus on criterion classification, but only recently was the first international symposium on EDS. Uh, I think there's some people here, I, I know at least one, I think we were two Canadians at that meeting, um, and uh, that was one year ago in September uh, 2012, the first international symposium. So how come uh, since the uh, 1998 Villefranche meeting for classification and diagnostic criteria, how come uh, we're still talking about the diagnosis and, and still have those difficulties? So, but in the last, those last 14 years, we accumulated lots of more knowledge and more, and we're speaking more about now uh, looking at EDS, another, another way of looking at it actually. So after uh, 100 years, we're still, um, that, this symposium, we're still uh, struggling with these aspects of the disease, diagnosis, nosology, symptomatology, the knowledge about connective tissue and the genetics. Uh, so I'll go through these uh, one by one. For the diagnostic, the, the Ville, uh, one of the aims of the Villefranche classification, and I quote, was to simplify the existing EDS classification so that it becomes more accessible to the average generalist. And it's true they simplified the classification. But I risk saying that <laughs> it didn't make a difference for the average generalist and um, who, who doesn't know about the Villefranche classification, but just the basic definition of Ehlers-Danlos and the three common fe features that we always hear about. So they remember it probably from a brief uh, um, uh, exposure to EDS in a clinic or their textbook. So what happens is they just remember these three common features and patients get these kinds of answers in their office. It's, uh, not very, it's not a very serious disease. Uh, you can join a circus. Uh, many have had that to comment. And no, it can't be EDS because you're not tall and skinny. Because I think a lot, a lot of physicians also don't differentiate the different hereditary connective tissue disorders. And I think they know Marfan much more or they remember that aspect of Marfan much more. So. Um, and the, the other aspect is the criteria, the diagnostic criteria. So even the specialists and the geneticists and the rheumatologists that are more familiar with the diagnostic criteria, well, uh, there's been lots of calls in the last year to, uh, to review them. So uh, maybe there are some people in this paper that are in the room, uh, but uh, they're really, and at the first international symposium a year ago, there was the panel really called for the recommendation was to revise those, especially the two, um, uh, two of the, the diagnostic criteria for the uh, common features, the joint hy hypermobility. So now we know that it's something that's not applied very uh, uniformly. There's an inter-examiner variability. And the most important thing is that it varies with age, gender, and ethnicity. So you can be very hypermobile when you're young, but it, it does change with age, and that's not taken into account often. And it's not all the joints that are measured, but lots, others are affected. And then there are also changes during lifetime for EDS where there can be muscle retractions that then prevent the, the measure of this hypermobility in those joints. And we have to uh, take into account acquired environmental factors like trauma, surgeries, physical, physical, physical exercise, pain, and contractures. And then there's a skin hypersensibility. <laughs> a lot of people think that it has to be that elastic to have EDS, but it's really not the case. And it's also difficult to assess depending of age. And there's the Remvik group in Denmark who did several studies to show that there's also inter-examiner um, variability, but the most amazing thing is that if you read different papers and protocols, even the upper level for normal skin extensibility varies a lot. It can go from 1.5 to 3 centimeters. So what is extensible skin? And also skin's consistency, uh, some, some uh, recommend that we withdraw that as a criterion. So. Second point, the nosology, the classification. So this is the Villefranche classification, which was a good thing 
because um, the uh, the uh, it reduced eleven from eleven subtypes to six subtypes. So that simplified life for physicians uh, diagnosing EDS, but. Maybe this desire to classify and categorize has its advantages, but it can also have it pits, its pitfalls. So, and if you um, notice here that there, between classical and hypermobile type, there's so many, uh, there's m most of the most common features uh, are um, overlap, so it's very difficult. And now what we know about the hypermobile type is that there's so many more signs and symptoms that even those that are described in the minor criteria in the classical can overlap. So now uh, there's a, many uh, think that also classical and hypermobile could be one and the same thing. Uh, and also I, I, I pointed out here the arthrochalasia, which is also autosomal dominant and also has some features very similar, which could make it difficult to uh, differentiate. And the other important thing is um, the, the concept of benign joint hypermobility or familial joint hypermobility syndrome. That was removed from the classification in 1988. It was uh, considered a subtype of EDS. And now we're coming back to that um, uh, concept. Uh, it was removed and there was a specific criteria that were established in 1998. Uh, but when you look at those criteria for joint hypermobility syndrome, well, the Baten score is a bit lower, but we still have the same problems with evaluating the Baten score. And uh, there's pain and uh, also other features which are similar also to the classical and the hypermobile type. So now there are many uh, physicians and researchers who also integrate both uh, EDS and uh, joint hypermobility syndrome into one, one syndrome, which can simplify things. So the third aspect is the symptomatology. Uh, so now with the knowledge we have, we know that EDS is more than just a, gen, a joint and skin disease. So with this, there was a review article uh, in the last year by uh, Dr. Castori, who reviewed that very well and uh, described so many symptoms that uh, uh, it's a very long paper. There's symptoms in every organ and system of the body. And there were three abstracts at the uh, international meeting. And what's, um, uh, and the, but the problem is these large cohorts or, uh, have not been published. So these were abstracts at the meeting and none of these large cohorts have been published yet. So I think that's what makes it difficult that, that the community knows all these symptoms. Um, and actually, Dr. Tinkle at the international meeting couldn't finish describing all these symptoms in his 30-minute talk. <laughs> and I won't certainly do it. Somebody's going to attempt, I think, uh, soon. But there's uh, symptoms, uh, I don't know how many. I, I calculated in Castori's article about 50 different signs and symptoms, but in all these possible organ symptoms. So, uh, and what's uh, very uh, interesting uh, Dr. Castori published this, is the extra articular disorders associated with generalized uh, joint hypermobility. And so these are all the co comorbidities, but the ones in red, what's interesting is uh, these are all papers published, most of them since 2000, except for the fibromyalgia that some have been published in the 1990s. But, um, What's interesting with the ones in red is that those were studies of cords with those disorders and they evaluated if they had joint hypermobility. So chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, uh, hiatus hernia, mitral valve prolapse, and urinary stress incontinence. Uh, so they, um, uh, and fibromyalgia as we know, a lot of patients are said that that is their diagnosis, but this is, uh, so we see these comorbidities. Uh, bleeding disorder was just, um, there was an interesting study done by a Vancouver bleeding disorder clinic where they evaluated joint hypermobility and other connective tissue disorders uh, in incoming patients with bleeding disorders. So that, that really uh, um, 
suggested a close relationship between bleeding disorders. So <laughs> it's much more than a skin and joint disease now we know. And it's not that su surprising. Connective tissue is two-thirds total volume of our body. And so, okay, so it's, uh, it's, very, it's in a very important tissue. And we, we know that it has many functions, uh, support, protection, nutrition, connection, repair, movement, growth, storage. But uh, I, uh, I don't know if you saw this article in The Scientist in May 2013, very interesting, you have to read it. And I learned by reading this article that the connective tissue is a tissue that's less studied, less research is done on that tissue than uh, other tissues of the body. And Dr. Hélène Langevin, who's a clinical endocrinologist in New England and the United States, she uh, started to get interested in chronic pain. And then, uh, because of her patients who would try alternative medicine, she got interested in ac acupuncture. And then she found a relation between uh, acupuncture and the connective tissue. And now she does research on the connective tissue. And uh, she. Um, and there's more and more research now, and so I won't, I can't get into the results of this, but it's very interesting, and, and we should be more interested in this research being done on, on uh, connective tissue to understand what's happening in, in, the, in the connective tissue disorders. I won't go through the genetics because uh, uh, a medical genetics will be doing that after me, but uh, I think the message there. And that we see and the people who call us up. And what we do is most of the time we refer, uh, I refer them to a genetic service and that's how they get their diagnosis. And most of them I think are diagnosed most of the time. Uh, but the thing is, there's a misunderstanding about genetics. Now people think that we can solve every diagnosis with genetics, which is not the case. So uh, other specialties will, when they see a negative result for a genetics report, they think that it's a negative diagnosis and that doesn't serve uh, the patient. So it should still be considered a clinical diagnosis because of <laughs> some uh, gaps in the genetics that we, we have to fill. So, uh, is there a new view of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Uh, I think that we, sh we should see it differently. Um, well, I think there's a, we're, we're already seeing it differently in the recent years. And it was, uh, I think, um, the conclusion of the first international symposium last year. But we have to see as not limited to specialized connective tissue, the skin, the ligaments, the tendons, but also the non-specialized connective tissue. And that's from that paper of the Dr. Langevin that I got this uh, um, expression. So it's a systemic disorder, and that's how we have to see it, as a systemic disorder with great variability, inter-individual, intrafamilial, and variability through life. And, and this is due to environmental factors and most probably uh, some modifier genes. So like, as Castori said in his paper, I, I think it should be better defined as an autosomal dominant disorder with com incomplete penetrance, variable expressivity, influenced by sex, because we know that women are more severely affected with age. And so seeing it that way is we're seeing it as other heterogeneous genetic disorders. And, and I think that's, uh, and not to see it as something we have to break down in, sub, in subtypes and to try to, uh, to simplify too much. It, it, but to, and that, um, so, and obviously there's locus and allelic heterogeneity that explains that. So I'll finish with uh, other photos uh, by Sarah Jill, because I spoke of the diagnostic odyssey, but it's obvious that there's also a treatment odyssey for the patients, and that's why this workshop this, this weekend. So uh, poor Sarah Jill also went through uh, lots of um, pain in, in trying to find out how to manage her disorder. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, how she pictures the disorder, as the French call it, an intermittent disorder. That some days, uh, somebody in the video also said that uh, earlier, but anyway, some days it, it's uh, they're difficult days. And she, she says she wished she could that day, but she can't. So, and this is the last photo by Sarah Jill. So thank you very much.
I actually have a question about the orphan diseases group. I mean, so how are you, how is that able to manifest itself? What, what does it do? Well, our, our main uh, service, as I was saying, is that is an information portal on, on rare diseases. So uh, people uh, call up with any rare disorder, and what we do is look for all the uh, relevant information. So it's, uh, it's, it's information, uh, professional, uh, official information. It could be about, uh, we refer them to patient organizations that exist if there are, but it could be research projects, clinical assays, any orphan drug that's in development, uh, uh, and we help them out also to get into research projects or clinical assays, uh, trials sometimes. And, and then there's a the support. We're not, we're a new organization also. We can't uh, offer very much, but what we do is refer refer them in the medical uh, health system or in the, in the, to community organizations for support. And uh, there is also a chronic pain organization in Quebec, but uh, now we know the Canadian one, so they're on our, our resource uh, list. And uh, so that's, that's what we do. And the other uh, aspect is trying to get um, uh, organized for rare diseases. We're, Canada is the only country that does not have a national plan or is not uh, building a national plan for rare diseases. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Weller? Yes. Do you have any information on why it's without the government? If there are any explanations? Uh, the factors that uh, contribute would be hormonal factors. It seems that often going through puberty, childbirth, um, uh, uh, pregnancy uh, ch uh, and menopause, uh, uh, each of those phases bring some changes in the disease and, and uh, uh, lots of those, uh, those sim signs and symptoms that are uh, all kinds of symptoms that appear with uh, age. Um, the other thing is uh, when we, s we said that, uh, we say that joint mobility varies with age, gender and ethnicity. Well, it's usually more mobile in the women, actually, than men. Yeah, so that's another factor. But if somebody else has answers. <laughs> Is, uh, there's more hypermobility, and also uh, another hypothesis I saw is about pain threshold, and uh, yeah, so and maybe there's differences in connective tissue that we don't know because we don't research it. <laughs> Thank you.